the audio. Okay. For over 35 years, our friends Bill and Emma Jean Kaiser have been convening uh, times of refreshing. They call it TOR in Switzerland. Let me make sure that that's... I don't like the way that's jumping around. Somebody let me know if the audio is okay, would you? I'll, I'll read a bit and then ch look at the, uh, the notes. Maybe Eddie could check on Facebook and see if, uh, if the audio is okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, let Sue know if the audio is coming through okay on her. So they've mic. been uh, m having this meeting for missionaries in Europe uh, for over 35 years, and they pay their way, I'm sorry, they pay all expenses for three days at a hotel in Switzerland. Now the missionaries are responsible for getting from where they live to the hotels. Okay, so Eddie gives me the okay signal on the audio. That's good. Okay, so they also gather gifts for these people. Um, it's sort of Christmas in the fall rather than Christmas at Christmas for these folks. The real time of refreshing. Now this is always always a truly life-giving time for these men and women who serve tirelessly in the secular world that is Europe. TOR 2021 is scheduled for October 19th through 22nd and this is an extra special TOR for as Bill shares in his recent letter. This has been a difficult couple of years for missionaries. We have had haven't had a TOR for, for those two years and they are ready for a refreshing in the presence of God and they currently have Bill reports that at the time of writing they had 98 missionaries registered so that's great. For a year leading up to each TOR Emma Jean collects special gifts for every missionary in attendance. For these men and women who give so much being on the receiving end is a great blessing. Now these are not folks that take a, a short-term missionary trip to some country. These are people who have moved from their homeland, particularly the US, some in Canada, and they have made residence, taken residence in the countries of Europe to spread the gospel. They're genuine missionaries. Ever since Becky Duncan presented Dorothea Trudell for induction into the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame, it's been my heart's desire to provide Emma Jean with enough copies of Becky's book, Dorothea Trudell, God's Forgotten Woman of Switzerland. And here it is. So proud of this book. Becky did all the research uh, while she was doing her master's it was her, I believe, her master's thesis at or Oral Roberts University. And then she brought it into this format. She did the cover. She did the, any editing. Well, I, I edit a little bit with her. Um, and she did, well, she did everything. Becky did everything. This is Becky's book. Dorothea Trudell, God's Forgotten Woman of Switzerland. Have you heard of her? Well, most I, I suspect that the missionaries who are even in Switzerland have never heard of Dorothea Trudell. Should they? I guess so. So in her book, Becky tells the inspiring story about this woman who lived in Manendorf, Switzerland in the 1800s. Although Dorothea's hometown is not far from the, where the TOR meet, where TOR meets, it is safe to say that those present would never have heard of this amazing woman of God. So Dorothea Trudell lived from 1813 to 1864, and she is in fact recognized by many as the Apostle of Healing and the founder of the Healing Home model of ministry to the sick. Her approach spread far and wide and was adopted by well-known ministers 
in the great healing movement of the 1800s and the early 1900s, including people that you may know, uh, know of, uh, such as Dr. Dowie in Zion City, Illinois. By the way, Gordon Lindsay, the co-founder of Christ for the Nations, was actually born in Zion City. His parents were there uh, learning from Dr. Dowie for a period of time. Also, she inspired Dr. Charles Cullis of Boston, Massachusetts, Charles and Sarah Parham, and Sarah's sister, Lillian Thistlewaite, as well as Carrie Judd Montgomery, just to name a few people. Now, we know that many men and women of God have been written out of history, but we can learn from these people. We can be inspired by their by what they did, how they obeyed God, and what the fruit of their ministries was or were. Um, so this is one of those forgotten women that God used mightily and her influence extended right down, has extended right down until today. Dorothea was also perhaps the first woman, the, pardon me, the first person in modern church history to popularize James 5, 14, and 15 in the ministry of healing. And that verse, in case it doesn't ring a bell, here it is. If anyone is sick among you, let him or her call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him or her, anointing that person with oil in the name of the Lord. And here's the promise. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him or her up. And if any that person has committed sins, they'll be forgiven. Okay, this was a key passage that God enlightened, made real to Dorothea Trudell. And so this God used her and the faith that he put in her and her workers to heal many people. So I want to be able, getting back to TOR, I want to be able to provide Emma Jean with 100 copies of Becky's book to give to the missionaries in Switzerland and throughout Europe at TOR 2021 in October. And the good news is they're paid for, they're ordered, they're scheduled to arrive on September the 1st. And we have a tentative date to meet with Bill and Emma Jean to deliver that, those 100 copies for them to put in their suitcases to take to TOR in October. Another little exciting sideline was Bill and Emma Jean invited Eddie and me to go to TOR this year. Um, we've had to decline, but we're honored that they would consider having us there. So. I just wanted you all to know, and if you don't have this little book, either ask me for it or go to Amazon.com and you can order it there. Dorothea Trudell, God's Forgotten Woman of Switzerland by Becky Duncan. Great book, much needed. Now, another important uh, letter that I have written in recent days is this. This is really important. This is not a negative. This is a uh, the pronouncement, if you like, declaration of a step forward. We've been seeking the Lord diligently about his plan for the next phase of the International Christian Women's Hall of Fame. And since, uh, I guess I wrote this on the 14th, so since yesterday, that would be August the 13th, we took a couple of major steps in that direction. Number one, we decided to move out of the retail space here where we are right now as of October 31st in anticipation of the new permanent site of God's choosing. Why are we doing this? And this, this is important. First, although we've seen God's hand mightily at work here in every way imaginable, we have not succeeded in rallying local interest and involvement. Although there is much interest from across the nation and literally around the world, 
local interest has just not shown up. And we have come, I particularly have come to a juncture where I cannot carry the load alone. I can't do it any longer. I don't have the physical strength for one thing. And there comes Tara, I believe. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. There she be. So we are persuaded that God has a plan to place this important ministry in a place where it will have maximum input, maximum impact with his chosen and dedicated co-workers. Meantime, we are trusting and obeying, knowing that we can count on him. Hey, he has led us, no question about it. He has led us this far, and this is just another time when he continues to lead. Secondly, although money is not the determining factor in our decision, it is something we must consider because we want to be wise stewards of the financial provision that he sends through our teammates and partners such as you. In December, the rent on this particular 1,300 square foot retail space on South Main Street in Grapevine will double. Now the reason, is that, I'll tell you what, space, retail space in Grapevine is incredibly expensive. Um, this little space goes for $3,353 a month. Now the owner really appreciates and has stood with us and has even paid half of that rent for these, what, three and a half years? Four years? <clears throat> but it's time now for us to take on the full load if we were to stay. But it just... Well, I've given, I'm giving you the total picture. It doesn't seem wise for us to do so. To understand the total outflow of expenses, it's important to know that the average cost of expenses is about $250 a month. So the total operational expenses would be about $3,600 a month. Now that may seem like peanuts to some folks, but hey, it's not peanuts. Every penny counts. And this, of course, is in addition to our personal living expenses. And we don't draw a salary from here. We have to trust God for our personal living space and for our personal ex expenses. So, number two, we've committed to a one-bedroom apartment here at the resort at 925, where we currently live, and, and this retail space is part of that, that whole uh, layout. It's the, the apartment is slightly larger than the one we have occupied for the past three years. I think the one we're in is like 750 square feet, something like that, and the new one will be like 870 square feet, something like that. Our move-in date is October 9th. This space will not only give us the living and office workspace that we need, but it will also house the library and the studio in the living room space. It's open, open floor plan. We'll continue to stream events such as the Tuesday Fellowship, special events and induction presentations, no problem. Number three, we cannot, what we cannot put on display at the apartment, we'll put in safe storage temporarily in anticipation of the opening of the new public space that God has in mind. And we're excited about this. This is not a sad thing for us. This is very exciting. This is a step forward. We're grateful for you. We're grateful that you understand and value the critical, important commission and the vision. And we're grateful for your continued financial and prayer support. Please don't pull back. We need that support ongoing as much as we ever have. The expenses will not decrease really. They'll remain pretty much the same because the new apartment will cost more than the current one we're in. Uh, but we will be able to consolidate some things. So we're looking to be even better stewards of the provision that God provides through you. 
As I close this report, I want to share a metaphor that I believe God has given me to illustrate his plan for the hall. And it's the little acorn, and you, you've heard me talk about it many times. This, it, perhaps you've heard me say, this work is small, but it's like an acorn, and one day it will be like a mighty oak. The planting of the Lord with good fruit springing up throughout the whole earth. I like Isaiah 61 3. Go ahead and check it out. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. But you know, an acorn must be planted and die before it can sprout and become that mighty oak. I have shuddered at the thought, yet without fear, because the transition is kind of like this little acorn where we're sitting right now going into the ground in order for the mighty oak to come forth that's the metaphor that's the picture i think perhaps that this is the moment in time when the little acorn is going into the ground and we await its emergence as that mighty oak amen, amen. so those of you who did not receive that letter i wanted to make sure that you had it you have the information now, I know that Eddie's there with his guitar, but I want to share a couple of other things. Uh, Paul and Eileen Kenny sent us a wonderful book that I have just finished reading. It's called The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset, Lockdowns, Vaccine Passports, and the New Normal. Key word there, exposing. We, uh, why we must unite in a global movement for health and freedom. This is a great book, and if you can manage to get it, I would recommend it. Now, it's not necessarily an easy read because these people are scholars. They've done the research. It's a medical doctor, isn't it? They've got the. They've done the research. They've got the all of the data. If they're not, this book is not a, an opinion book, and the the authors are Dr. Joseph Mercola and Ronnie Cummings with a foreword by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, I'll just leave it at that because I, I do want us to get on with things tonight, but there it is, highly recommended. Um, it's even got some advice about, about from this doctor about how to strengthen your immune system, how to eat well, and how poor eating has made made us here in America and other places vulnerable to this and other other um, sicknesses yeah other viruses and so on the other book that I'm about halfway through now is by the president of Moody Bible Institute Dr. Erwin Lutz Lutzer um, it's called When a Nation Forgets God Seven Lessons We Must Learn from Nazi Germany this is a critical time. Uh, Eddie has shared with you uh, his uh, ideas from scripture about do we comply or not, to comply or not to comply, that is the question. And he's working on the presentations that he uh, did on video. He's working to get those into a book. How long do you think it'll be, Eddie, the book? about? 60 pages approximately yeah yeah one of it those wonderful large, nuggets yeah. that's easy to read and but just can really help but people. very focused very focused okay i wanted to be sure i got all that in tonight and eddie it's uh five after the hour i'm turning it over to you uh becky duncan wanted to know if that book is available on amazon becky i am sure they are could you give her um uh, the, the name of the authors. Uh, maybe we could email that to you, Becky, so that you sure that you get the right one. I hope it's available. Yes, it is. It must be. I, yeah. I looked it up. It is. Yeah, because it is available. Uh, uh, Paul sent yes. it to us via Amazon. Paul and Eileen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is available there. Good read. Who, who's Very the author? the name again, Sue? Dr. Joseph Mercola. Joseph Mercola. M-E-R-C-O-L-A and Ronnie, R-O-N-N-I-E Cummins, C-U-M-M-I-N-S. 
And Alan Brown in Virginia must have the book because he says, great book. All well, right. Hey, great. that's wonderful. Okay. Hey, uh, Sue, I didn't know you were going to uh, share the news about the transition with the hall and everything. And, uh, but it goes right along with my uh, message tonight that's been stirring in my heart. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open up. I'm going to be reading from Judges chapter 6. And my theme is taking the limits off God and yourself. Taking the limits off God and yourself. But in the meantime, Alan Brown in Virginia. Now, Alan, I believe he and Delilah Hicks in Paris are cousins. And that's the way Alan has uh, connected with us. But Alan wanted us to sing, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Hey, that's always appropriate, but especially in times like these, when the world is in, in turmoil and upheaval. Hey, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful faith and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grave one more time Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Yes, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you tonight. We bless your name, Jesus. And Lord, we do choose to, to turn our eyes upon you. In a world that is in upheaval and turmoil, Lord, we turn our eyes upon you. And Lord, we pray for the poor people in Afghanistan and, and especially for the Christians. Just reading a thing on C, from CBN News where I came, that Christians are already under persecution. Some have reported receiving phone calls and the voice saying, we're coming after you. So Lord, we pray for the Christians in, in Afghanistan. God, we pray for deliverance. We pray for protection. And we pray for boldness and strength in their time, of, uh, in their time, in their hour of need in Jesus name thank you for it Lord we bless and we praise and we honor your name sir hallelujah blessed be your name thank you Lord and Brad pray for let's Brad. pray for Brad our friend longtime friend Brad Crook Brad uh, and his wife from Long Island New York and I Brad used to publish a Christian newspaper called life the life what do you call it Sue lifetime something lifetimes um, and uh, I wrote an article for it for several years and uh, often got together with them, ministered in the church where he was involved there in Long Island, New York. And uh, he and his wife moved to Florida, but uh, he's in the hospital right now. And uh, with the virus, with, with the virus, but he had other underlying physical uh, sicknesses and issues. And so Sue had just asked his wife, how's, how's he doing? And she said something like this. She said he had a cardiac arrest this morning. And she said, only God knows, or it's something like he's, it's in God's hands right no, now. They resuscitated him. And so um, they res resuscitated him, yeah. And so let's pray for Brad Crook and, and his Nancy. wife, Nancy. The and good Nancy. people, wonderful people that love the Lord. 
and have ser been serving him for many years. Lord, pray for our friends Brad and Nancy Crook. Lord, I pray that you would intervene for Brad, Lord, and even give him a few more years on this earth to serve you, oh God. Intervene, Lord, for Brad Crook. We pray tonight, Lord. Have mercy upon him, O oh God, and deliver him, I pray, from all of the sickness that has come against him. Deliver him from this virus and from the other sicknesses, O oh God. Stretch out your hand, Lord, we pray for Brad Crook now in the name of Jesus. We pray for Nancy, Lord, fill her heart with your peace and with your comfort. Almighty God, we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping Brad and Nancy Crook in this hour of need. In Jesus' name, praise and bless you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, Sue, are you on um, uh, Facebook? I mean, there are some comments there that you might want to, to see. Alan Brown said, nice to hear Sue, first time for me. And Delilah Hicks said, she is awesome. <laughs> oh, so Delilah. hallelujah. And I know Sue appreciates the encouraging words. Okay, hey, going to talk about tonight. Take the limits off God and yourself. And the reason we need to take the limits off God is he is a limitless God. And it's only in the context that we are connected to him that then we then have to also take the limits off of ourselves. I'm going to be reading particularly from Judges chapter 6 about Gideon because Gideon is the one where the, the story is so compelling that God called Gideon to take the limits off yourself, Gideon. See yourself like I see you, Gideon. But first I want to mention the part about us taking the limits off of God. Now there's a passage in Psalm 78 verses 40 through 41. If anybody wants my outline, let me know and I'll send it to you. Psalm 78, verses 4. Somebody needs this tonight. Somebody needs this. Hey, this is for us tonight because I believe uh, the moves that Sue talked about taking, and who knows, you know, we're planning to put the, um, uh, the displays of the Hall of Fame in storage temporarily, but who knows? We may not have to. We don't know. We're taking the limits off God. We're not retreating, we're making a move and a change, but we're taking, also taking the limits off God. Now, uh, Roman number one here in my outline is Psalm 78, 40 through 41. Listen to this, and it's talking about the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And, and it's amazing that they would limit God after all they had seen God do in the land of Egypt, delivering them from Pharaoh. Okay. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Oh, we don't want to be a people that provoke God and grieve him, do we? And it says, yes, again and again they tempted God, listen to this, and they limited the Holy One of Israel. Wow, they limited. Uh, and, and somebody would say, well, no, you can't, we can't limit God. God is God. Well, now let me say this. Yeah, God is sovereign. He is supreme. And his ultimate plan is going to uh, unfold, but we can limit him. But see, because God has chosen to work through human vessels, and so we can limit him in our lives by our unbelief, by our wrong decisions, by not choosing to trust him. And the way they limited God, you remember uh, there were 12 spies that Moses sent into the land not to decide if they could take the land, but to decide what is the best strategy for taking the land. God had said, I'm giving you this land. Doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk. And by the way, when God gives you something, doesn't mean it's going to fall on you like ripe cherries falling off of a tree. Doesn't mean there's going to be the red carpet rolled out to you. Uh, there was probably going to be a battle to apprehend and to appropriate what God has given you. So God said, I've given you the land. And so Moses decides to send 12 spies to see what is the best strategy for taking the land God has given us. And you know the story, the 12 came back. 10 of them brought back, the Bible called it an evil report. Now it wasn't filled with swear words, four-letter words. It was a report filled with unbelief. 
Ten of the spies came back and they said, we are not able. They measured the giants. They saw giants and they saw walled cities. And instead of measuring the giants up against God and His promise, they measured the giants against themselves. And here's what they said. They said, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, how did they know? They didn't talk to any of, of those giants. But they said, we looked like grasshoppers up beside them, and we looked like grasshoppers to them. My friends, do not allow a grasshopper complex to come into your life where everything, every challenge looks insurmountable and impossible. They measured the giants against themselves rather than God. Caleb and Joshua, on the other hand, had their eyes on God and His promise. And they said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. But the ten spies contradicted what Caleb and Joshua said, and they limited God, saying, we, this is a quote, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. We are not able to do this. God must have made a mistake telling us we could have this land. <laughs> No, 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 God didn't make a mistake. They needed to take the limits off God and, and, and actually off of themselves. But they limited God and that entire generation died in the wilderness outside of God's promises because they put limits on God. Oh, may we take the limits off of God. May we not be like that generation. May we be like Caleb and Joshua. Out of that generation, Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that got to go into the land and partake of the, uh, of the blessings of that promised land, the milk and honey that flowed. Now, I want to move on because here's where I want to spend most of the time. When we take off the limits off God, then we have to take the limits off of ourselves as well. We can't think of ourselves as grasshoppers. We have to take the limits off of ourselves. And in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, the preceding verses tell us about the, the, the time of Israel at this time. They had turned against God. They had become idolatrous, worshiping the idols of the land. And God allowed them to be overrun by the Midianites and other peoples. And uh, it was such a terrible situation. Uh, the scripture says that they went into the mountains and they made dens and they lived in caves and so on. And they would come out and they would, they would uh, plant their crops, but then the Midianites would come down and overrun them and eat their crops and what they didn't eat, they would destroy. And the Israelites, they were just totally, completely overwhelmed and in despondency and defeat. And one day there was a young man by the name of Gideon he was threshing f wheat in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites, trying to thresh out some grain for food. Why was he doing it in the wine press? Because it wasn't the time for grapes. It, it was harvest time for the wheat. And he thought maybe if he went to this wine press and threshed out this wheat, he could hide from the Midianites and they wouldn't take it from him. So here he is in fear of the enemy, trying to thresh out some wheat for himself and his family to get by on. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is where we're going to start, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. I want you to notice that the word angel is capitalized and the word Lord is all in capitals. Angel of Yahweh. This is actually a, what's called a theophany, a manifestation of God. God appearing in human form. Now, the conversation goes on here. It's obvious uh, that it's the Lord because then it says that the Lord said to Gideon. And it's all in caps. And when you see the word the Lord all in caps, that means it's a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh, or in the King James it's called Jehovah, which is the most common name for God in the Old Testament, and it is His personal covenant name, Yahweh. And when you see that name 
translated in all caps, Lord, you know that's the, the, the personal covenant name of God. Uh, when you see the word God, that's the translation of the Hebrew word Elohim. When you see the word Lord in lowercase letters, it's usually the translation of the word Adonai. But when you see here the angel of the Lord, this is an Old Testament appearance of God uh, to Gideon. And, uh, and again, the scripture refers to him as later says, the Lord said to Gideon. And so here's what the Lord said to Gideon, which astounded Gideon. He said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> God called him a mighty man of valor. And, and, and I, I, can, I can imagine Gideon looking around wondering if there's somebody else here. Because here he is in fear. His whole nation, his family are living under the subjection of these foreign peoples. And they're living in continual fear of them. And God appears to him and says to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon needed to see himself as God saw him. God saw potential in Gideon that he didn't see in himself and nobody else had ever seen in him. God sees potential in you nobody else has ever seen before. <laughs> God saw potential in me that nobody saw. It wasn't too long ago, it's been a few years ago, I was preaching at a church in uh, First Assembly of God in Hugo, Oklahoma, pastored by Keithan Brown, Keithan and Barbara Brown. And Keithan grew up in the church that my dad pastored. He's a few years younger than me, but I remember Keithan and his twin sister, Frida. And uh, there was a, another, uh, there was a woman there that's a member of his church but she also used to visit our church a lot. Her name's Linda Wall. And she was telling me that she said to my dad back during those days, and it was after I had committed my life to the Lord, she said, do you think, uh, do you, do you think Peter Eddie will ever go into the ministry? And she said, my dad said, well, Pete might. Said, Eddie won't. Said, he's too shy. <laughs> Oh, I thank God, God saw something in me, potential in me that nobody else saw. So did I. <laughs> she said, so did I. I guess you saw some potential in me 45 years ago, 46 years ago. <laughs> and I want you to know, my friends, God sees potential in you nobody else sees. And God calls Gideon. Nobody else saw him like this. God called him a mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you. And Gideon begins to respond and begins to question this. And, and he asked a question that all of you have probably asked if you've been serving the Lord very long. He basically said, if the Lord is with us, why are we in this mess? <laughs> if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And then the second question he said is, and where are all the miracle, miracles our Father have told us about? Wow. Wow. Incredible questions. If the Lord is with us, we're, why, why has all of this happened to us? Why are we in this mess? And where are all the miracles our fathers told us about? It's interesting that God didn't even bother to answer his questions. <laughs> and sometimes our questions are not even worth answering. We just need to get on with the job. And the Lord did not respond to his questions, but gave him a commission. And here's, now listen to this. I'm, I'm, here I'm talking about taking the limits off yourself. Not because you're anybody important, but because you have become aligned with God. You have a relationship with the Almighty now. And so the Lord did not respond and, and answer his questions for him. He just gave them a commission and he said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel. Wow. Go in this might of yours. Gideon, you can save this nation. My friends, I believe that we as Christians can save this nation. That over the last number of years have been 
as some would say, going in a, ba hand ba on a, in a hand basket to hell. But God said to Gideon, this weak, fearful individual, go in this strength of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Now, now there's the key, have I not sent you? My friends, if God sends you, heard somebody say many years ago, you know, the Bible says in, uh, uh, I think it's in, in Romans chapter 10, it says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And I heard someone say years ago, I don't know, it might have been R.W. Schembach, said some were called, some were sent, and some just got up and went. <laughs> My friends, we don't want to be those that just got up and went. But I believe God is calling. I believe God is sending in this hour. And so let, let me just read here uh, uh, how Gideon still responds and tells God how weak and, and um, ineffective he is and how unqualified he is. So God says to him, No, you go in this your strength and save Israel. So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? You know, a commission from God will always cause us to say, God, how can I do this? Ah, uh, you know, God, God, well, let me just go ahead and read the, 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 uh, the, the conversation here. And he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Manasseh, one of, the, one of the 12 tribes. Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. How can I ever do something like this? And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. In other words, it's not going to be that hard, Gideon, because, you, you know, when, when God is with us and our confidence and our faith is in him, it's not hard. He said it's going to be like fighting one man, Gideon. There were actually 135,000 of them. We know that from some things. There 135,000 of these Midianites. But the first thing God has to do with Gideon is begin to see himself as God sees him. To begin to see his own potential as God sees him. And he needs to take the limits off God and, and in doing that he's going to have to take the limits off of himself and know what God can do through him. You know, for any of us, for God to use us, he has to bring us to this place, this place of weakness and inadequacy. You remember Moses? I think it was Stephen in Acts chapter 7 in giving a, uh, a sermon before the Sanhedrin. He, he described Moses as being uh, trained in all the ways of the Egyptians and was a man mighty in word and in deed. He was a mighty orator and a mighty in word and deed. And indeed, according to Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, Moses, who was reared in Pharaoh's house, became the commander-in-chief of Pharaoh's army and led a successful campaign against the Ethiopians. He was trained in all the ways of the worldly Egyptians. He was a mighty in word and deed. Man, he had it together. His first few years he was reared in his, by God's providential care, he was raised in his Jewish parents' home. And so he knew his true origins, his true heritage. And apparently Moses thought, well, I can see how God's going to use me now. Look. Look how great I am. I've got my PhD from the Egyptian University. Look at all this training I've had. <laughs> Is there any evidence he thought that way? Yes, absolutely. Because Stephen goes on in, in telling about this. He, he talks about how Moses killed an Egyptian. When he saw an Egyptian abusing an Israelite, 
He looked this way and that way to see if was watching, and then he intervened and he killed the Egyptian. And Stephen said, because he thought that by his hand, God would deliver Israel. Now, when it talks about somebody's hand, it's talking about their ability and their power. That Moses thought that by his hand, by his ability, that God would deliver Israel. No, God's not going to deliver Israel, Moses, by your hand. Because then Moses would get all of the glory. So God put him through his school. Forty years in the wilderness. <laughs> Forty years in the wilderness alone. Herding sheep. Out there in the desert, in the wilderness, nobody around. In the stillness and the quietness of the wilderness. He gave up all of those hopes and those dreams that he had. How all of his training in Egypt, God was going to use it and he was going to be the great deliverer of Egypt. And there in the wilderness, all of that dissipated and disappeared and it went away. And finally Moses was humbled to the place. <laughs> That one day, after 40 years in the wilderness, he saw a burning bush. 80 years old now. Oh, he's too old now. No, you're never too old for God. You're never too young for God. You're never too old. If God can get our hearts right and get, get, get us positioned, never too young, never too old. Never too skinny, never too fat. <laughs> Just make sure your heart is in the right place with God. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And God, you know the story, God appeared in a burning bush. Should have burned up out there in the wilderness, a dry tumbleweed. Should have burned up in a few minutes, but it didn't. It just kept burning and burning. And finally Moses said, now, now this is strange. I'm going to turn around and see what's going on here. And when God saw that he turned aside, when God saw that he got his attention, my friends, God will do signs and wonders to get people's attention. God does signs and wonders not to prop up a preacher, and to make him look good. No, God does signs and wonders to get people's attention so that we can then share the gospel with them. And when God saw that Moses had turned aside and he had his attention, he began to speak to him from the burning bush and sending him to go down to Egypt. And Moses said, no, I don't want to go, God. You get somebody else to go. <laughs> Forty years ago, he was gung-ho. He was ready to go out. <laughs> and be the great deliverer. But now, that fleshly motive, that fleshly enthusiasm is all gone. And he says, God, I just soon you get somebody else. Get somebody else to go. And Moses, God, no, Moses, I've called you to this. And so there, 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 there was a, a bit of conversation there. Now here's the point, though. Moses now went back no trust in Moses. He went back not trusting in his hand and his arm. Now he goes back to Egypt trusting in God's hand <laughs> and God's arm. And whereas 40 years before when he was trusting in his own arm and he was wanting to do the same thing, he was wanting to deliver Israel. But his, his, his approach was wrong. His approach was on himself and how great he was, and how ready he was. And he thought that by his hand, by his wisdom, by his power, he would deliver Egypt. And Sue, I got this from you actually years ago. And when he tried to deliver Israel in his own power, he killed one Egyptian and had to run for his life. Forty years later, he goes back a changed man. <laughs> Trusting only on the Lord, leaning on Him. Oh, are we learning to lean on Him? The flesh will let you down. But He goes back, a changed man, leaning on the Lord. And He wiped out the entire Egyptian army. I'll never forget some years ago. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think Charles will mind me telling this story. Uh, some years ago, we were having some meetings uh, there, uh, I, I, and I think this was, I'm, well, I'm not sure what night it was on, but anyway, we had quite a, quite a crowd in, 
and at that time we had a platform and, and so on and cheers set up. And there were quite a few people that were coming in and it was uh, 7 o'clock when we were supposed to start. And uh, uh, I said to Charles, I said, uh, and, and some people around us could hear us. I said, uh, I said uh, are, are you going to start? And I said, it's time to start. He said, no, you go ahead and start. I said, no, you, you start. He said, no, I don't want to start. You go ahead and start. <laughs> I said, oh, you're the pastor here. You start. No, you start. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to. You go ahead. <laughs> so to try to explain <laughs> what was going on to people who heard us talking, I said, you know, one way you can tell a preacher who's never been through the wilderness, they are ready to be in the limelight. And I used the example of Moses. Now, he was ready <laughs> to do his thing and deliver Israel. But after 40 years in the wilderness, he said, God, get somebody else. I just soon just keep herding these sheep out here in the wilderness. Get somebody else. Send them down there to do it. <laughs> I said, you can always tell a preacher who hasn't been through the, <laughs> through the wilderness, they're ready to be in front of the camera. They're ready to be in the limelight. I said, uh, so I... I commended Charles. I said, Charles has been through the wilderness. <laughs> he just said somebody else would do it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, Father, thank you in the name of Jesus. But I want to tell you something. I believe I heard the Holy Spirit say to me one time. It, said, uh, it says of John the Baptist that he was in the wilderness until the time of his showing unto Israel. He was in the wilderness. There was a time set by God that would be a time for him to come forth publicly. But until that time, he was hidden away in the wilderness. Nobody knew what he was there, what was going on. He was in the wilderness. And I felt I heard the Holy Spirit say, I've got a lot of people, they're hidden in the wilderness. But they're going to come forth in my time. My friends, be faithful in the wilderness. Be faithful in the wilderness. Be diligent in the wilderness. Go ahead and prepare yourself in the wilderness. <laughs> so that you're ready when God does bring you out in the open. You're ready. Hallelujah. So, Gideon is, is talking about how unqualified and inadequate he is. You know, that's the kind of person God is looking for. People that have to lean on Him, that will put their trust in Him. In fact, we see this story on further folding that, that il illustrates this truth. Because So Gideon, he, he finally, so he calls together an army, and he gathers an army of 32,000 to face 135,000 Midianites. So he is outnumbered approximately four to one. 32,000 against 135,000. But notice what God says to Gideon about his army in Judges chapter 7, verse 2. Listen to this. And the Lord said to him, The people who are with you are too many. You're too strong, Gideon. You've got too many people. Why? How could that be, Lord? Well, here's the reason God said. You are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel claim victory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. My own power, my own wisdom saved me. Gideon, you're too strong. I can't afford to give you the victory because these people, they're too prone to pride. And if I give you victory, outnumbered four to one, they're going to be all puffed up and think about how wonderful they are. And they want to get. They, they're they're going to want to put their picture on the front page and open a new Facebook page about how, <laughs> all they have accomplished. <laughs> I can't afford to give you victory, Gideon. Going to have to prune. So tell everybody if they if, who's afraid, tell them to go home. So Gideon made an announcement to his army of thirty-two thousand. He said, "Anybody who has has any fear, if you're afraid, you're welcome to go home." You should have seen the cloud of dust that arose as 22,000 headed for home, left him with 10,000. Now he's outnumbered 14 to 1. But you know what God said? 
Gideon, you're still too strong. Still got too many people. If I give, you, if I give them victory, they're going to think how wonderful they are. And they're going to claim that their own hand, their own power, their own wisdom. My friend, if you feel that you have been weakened in recent days, it may be that God is getting you ready for the most incredible victory that you have ever seen. If you feel that you have been reduced and brought down and weakened, maybe God is getting you ready. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so then there was another test that I believe had to do with vigilance. It had to do, he had them take them down to the water and have them to drink. And what it seems like is the ones who just got down on their knees and put their face down into the water, they were put to a side, but those who scooped up their hand and drink to where that they could be looking. They didn't even have to take their, their shield off or their armor off, but they scoop up their hands where they could be on the lookout for the enemy. They were watchful. They were vigilant. You know, there are so many scriptures in the New Testament that talks about vigilance. Jesus said to watch and pray. Be vigilant. And, and, and Peter said... Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes about as a roaring lion. So, so he needed people that were vigilant. They weren't uh, lazid... What's the word? They weren't lazidacial. No, that's not the word. Lackadaisical. Lackadaisical. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> I knew there was a word there that expressed what I wanted to say. He, he needed people that were not lackadaisical, that were not lazy, but they were people who were vigilant, on the ball, alert, watchful. And so there were only 300 of those, so he set those aside, sent the rest home. Now he's outnumbered approximately 140 to 1. For every single soldier he's got, the enemy has 140. And God says, now these are pretty good odds, Gideon. Now I'm willing to give you victory with these 300. Oh, my friends, I, I, I had a pastor years ago when Sue and I were in Canada. A pastor wrote to us and said he was having a Gideon revival. <laughs> in other words, people were leaving left and right. <laughs> and he believed that God was getting him ready for a tremendous victory. So that's why I say if you feel like you have been pruned and reduced and weakened and lowered, it may be this is a time to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look totally in His wonderful face. And it may be that He's about to give you the greatest victory you have ever seen. And so sure enough, Gideon with his 300 men went out and totally, totally, overwhelmingly defeated that army of 135,000 Amalekites. And it was, it, it was such a victory, nobody, nobody could go around bragging about it. They knew it had to be God. Everybody knew this is God. That's the kind of victories we want to see. Such overwhelming, such incredible. Oh, this is what I want to see for the Hall of Fame. So for the, for the provision for the housing, such, a, such an incredible, overwhelming provision that everybody knows this, this is God. So even though we, we must take, there's almost this dichotomy here, even though we must take the limits off of ourselves, at the same time we have to become weak in ourselves. What did you say, Sue? Oh, okay. Let me back up just a little bit. We must take the limits off of ourselves, but then we must become weak in ourselves, in our flesh, and as far as trusting in our flesh. Let me just read, a, I'll close this with a couple of quotes from, from Paul the Apostle. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Paul the Apostle said, and he's had a lot to say about this, he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as being from ourselves, 
but our sufficiency is from God. I'll say that again. Not that we are sufficient. Some translations say adequate. I'm going to use the word adequate this time. Not that we are adequate to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Gideon's adequacy came from God. Moses' adequacy came from God. And then Paul tells about a time when he learned this lesson that, that Gideon learned. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And I'm giving my translation of this verse, which is, which is an accurate translation because I've, I've studied the Greek words. God said to Paul, and here's how Paul says it, and he, and he that is God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is maximized in weakness. Now this is, this is a principle of the kingdom of God. This is a, a, a spiritual principle. God's power is maximized in our weakness. Now it's not the kind of weakness where we are turned in on ourselves with a pity party, poor me on me. No, it, it is the kind of weakness where we put our entire trust in Him and not in ourselves. Where we turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and we lean hard upon Him, trusting totally in Him, not in ourselves. And God said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is maximized in weakness. And Paul said, therefore, most gladly I will boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, listen to that. Now, this goes against so much teaching in the charismatic movement today. Paul says, I will therefore boast in my weaknesses. See, is he talking about having a bad confession? No, he's talking about having integrity and admitting how much I need God. Admitting how weak Paul is in his flesh and how much I need God. And so he's saying, I will boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now that word rest upon is, a, is from the very same word that is used in Luke when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her, who was a virgin, that she was going to bring forth, conceive, and give birth to a son, and he would be called the Son of the Most High, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. And she responded like Gideon did. Gideon said, how can I ever do this? And she said, how can this be? You see, God's vision always causes us to ask, how can this be? Because God's vision for you is a whole lot bigger than you are. You, you can't bring to pass God's vision. I'll say that again. You cannot bring about God's vision for you. Only God can bring about God's vision for you. That's why we'll have to learn to totally trust in Him. And so, Mary said, how can this be? This is impossible what you're telling me. I'm a virgin. How can this be? And Gabriel said, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Same Hebrew word that Paul said, that the power of Christ may rest upon me may overshadow me. In each case, they were admitting their own need for God, that they were humanly unable and inadequate to bring about the promise that is being given to them. And in each case, how can this be? Gabriel says the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and the power of the Most High shall rest upon you or overshadow you. And then Paul says, hey man, I have learned this principle that God's power becomes maximized 
when I realize how weak I am and how much I need Him and I look to Him with all of my heart and my soul, His power becomes maximized in me. In other words, when God is looking for somebody to do a job, He doesn't look for somebody whose response is, well, God, I've been, I've been wondering when you're going to realize that I'm the one for this job. <laughs> Because you know how, how ready I am. You know how qualified. No, no, no. That's, God avoids those people like the plague. <laughs> because they're too full of themselves, trusting themselves, trusting in their own strength, trusting in their own wisdom, their own arm. No, God looks for people like Gideon who says, God, how can I ever do this? Look who I am. My, my clan is the, is, is the smallest in Manasseh, and I'm the weakest and the smallest in my family. So how could you ever use me for this? And God says, hey, you're just the kind I'm looking for because you're going to have to trust me, get in with all of your heart. And I'm going to get all the glory because you're going to know it wasn't you that did it, get in. You're going to know it was me. Hallelujah. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my weakness. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not going to be afraid to admit how much I need God. That the power of Christ may rest upon me and overshadow me. And Paul is talking about having integrity. One of the greatest revelations I had of a person who was a great man of faith met him in 1988, had built, along with his mother-in-law, had built the largest church in the world. I don't know that much about it today, but at that time had over 700,000 members. And that time was, was adding 13,000 per month. But I remember being in a session. It was a, he was having a pastor's leadership conference. There were about 600 Christian leaders from all over the world coming there to, you know, to, you know, to learn how he had done this. But one of the things that somewhat surprised me because I was used to here in America I remember and these these are people that actually I respect but uh, I think I, I think they were a little off in some ways but I remember um, Norval Hayes good man <laughs> I liked Norval <laughs> but I remember Norval saying uh, I don't have any sad days I don't have any Blue Mondays. <laughs> and going on like this. And I remember one time, uh, Norval was a, was a businessman and he traveled around preaching, but he did have a church that he had started, but he didn't pastor the church. He had somebody else pastoring it while he was out traveling around and working with his businesses and traveling around speaking. So we were in a conference. Now, that's been a long time ago. And um, we were in a conference that Norval was hosting in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and it so happened the fellow who pastored his church was there. And uh, Sue and I were sitting with him at a table in the restaurant, in, in the hotel. And he was sharing with us the struggles they were going through in the ministry there, in Norval Hayes' ministry in the church, the struggles they were going through. And I said to him, now I was being halfway jokingly, I said, well, Norval says he never has any blue Mondays or any sad days. He said, that's because Norval is never around on Monday. <laughs> but Yonggi Cho, this individual who is held in such high esteem all over the world for the incredible congregation he had built, there was somebody else had spoken uh, that day and he got up and he said uh, he said to them he said you know he said he said you said something that lifted the depression off me he said something happened yesterday and I've been depressed ever since Yonggi Cho and he said he, he mentioned what this person said he said when you said that he said the depression lifted off of me and I thought man how unlike preachers in America who will not he will not admit they ever had a problem <laughs> or they ever had a worry of what an anxiety of any kind. I thought, wow, how different this is. Here's a man with integrity, and I could tell more about that, but I don't have time. Yeah, I know. 
Well, uh, you, some of you heard me tell this story, so I'll tell it again. He told this story. Had the 600 pastors from all over the world, a lot of from Asia, different places, l laughing, almost rolling forward laughing, because they had all probably been there to Swandiger and another. But he told about when he started building, his church had greatly expanded, had thousands of people, and he was becoming known throughout Korea and Asia and even in America. And uh, he decided to build a massive new building. And, uh, and he was going to build some condominiums on the property they had purchased and then sell the condominiums to pay for the because he felt he had some inside information that the, uh, the, the, prices were, the land prices were going to go way up. So he said his wife challenged him about this and said, did God tell you to build these condominiums? And he said, no, but you see, he was, he was relying on his own wisdom, on his own arm to save him. And he said, well, no, but uh, he said, I know what I'm doing. And he said, his wife said, and he was telling this to this, this group of about 600, this is in South Korea, so his wife said, well, if God didn't tell you to build those condominiums, I don't think you should build it. And of course, he ignored and said, well, I know what I'm doing. So anyway, they started building the condominiums and started building the new building. And he said a recession hit the economy of South Korea. And all of a sudden, the dollar was devalued. And, uh, and, and inflation was going up. And uh, he didn't have the money to pay the contractors that were building. And they had dug a big hole in the ground for the foundation, but then he couldn't pay them, so they stopped working. And the... the Construction had stopped on the condominiums, and they were only partially finished. And uh, so, you know, he was praying, he's believing God, and, um, and he said always before, he said the people, they're, they're praying people, and always before they had gotten in and they'd prayed things through, he said, but this time he said it seemed that people's attitude was, well, the pastor talks big, let's see how he gets out of this one. And... Um, he said, then contractors st started filing lawsuits against him and against the church because they, they weren't getting paid. And so in desperation, he put their personal house home up for sale. And he moved his wife and his family into an unfinished condominium. Now you can imagine how his wife feels about this. She's the one who told him, don't do this. And now he moves them into an unfinished condominium that doesn't have electricity and they have to ride an open elevator shaft up to the seventh floor to get to it. And he said his wife is very upset and she's saying to him, uh, very, very angry and upset, I told you if you'd listen to me we wouldn't be in this mess. I told you not to build these condominiums. And, uh, and then he said people started leaving the church and it was a terrible situation. And he's being reduced. He's being pruned. And it's not a it's not an easy thing. And it came to a climax one day. He said uh, his wife was telling him again one day, if you had listened to me, and he was hearing this every day, if you'd listened to me, we wouldn't be in this mess. I told you not to build these condominiums. And he was under such stress and everything. He said he hit her and broke her nose. And... Uh, so she packed her suitcase and went to her mother's, which was his associate pastor. They had founded the church together. And uh, a woman whom he had great respect for. So anyway, he said his wife was packing her suitcase and said, she said, I always wanted to marry a Pentecostal preacher, but I never thought it would be like this. <laughs> My friends, you may find that the ministry is not what you thought it was going to be. There are challenges, real challenges, not make-believe challenges, they're real challenges, my friends, but God will see us through if we'll turn our eyes upon Jesus. Get rid of our own self-sufficiency. Amer the American church needs to get rid of its own self-sufficiency. And so it was like that was it, and she left, and he said, he, that was it. And so he said he climbed out on the, the ledge and he decided he was going to commit suicide jump off and kill himself. He, here's what he said. He said, that was when the great Cho died. <laughs> because he was the great pastor building, young man building this great church of thousands of people, largest church in Korea, now known all over the world and even in America. He said, that was when the great Cho died. 
There are some great shows in America that need to die for us to see great revival. And he said he prayed one prayer before he was going to jump because, I mean, he believed in heaven. He believed in hell. He didn't believe it was wrong to take lives. And so he, did, he didn't know if he would go to hell or not for taking his own life. So he said he said to God, God, I have really tried to serve you to the best of my ability. So when I jump off of here and kill myself, please don't send me to hell. <laughs> So he said there was a, 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 just a, a, a thought floated through his mind. He didn't have any great experience, but he said he, just a, a thought floated through his mind, which no doubt was the Holy Spirit. If you have enough courage to jump off here and kill yourself, why don't you redirect that courage and persevere through this? Yeah, so he thought on that for a moment. Redirect this courage. If I have enough courage to jump off of here, Redirect that courage and, and persevere through this. So he said he climbed back off the ledge and said he knew the first thing he do, had to do, he had to get reconciled to his wife. So he said he went to his mother-in-law's home. And his wife was lying on the bed with her eyes closed. And he said he began to apologize and said she didn't move, didn't open her eyes, didn't respond. And so he said he took her by the hand and, be, and was responding and, and apologizing and telling how sorry he was. He said, but her hand was just limp. There was no response. And then he gave some really, this is some really good advice. He said, then I got really scared. He said, because as long as you're fighting, there's hope. He said, but if one marriage partner stops fighting, he said, you're in big trouble. He said, she had stopped fighting and I knew I was in big trouble. He said, so I knelt down by the bed and I took a hold of her hand. And he said, I began to really condemn myself in prayer. And I begin to say, God, I'm a no good pastor. I'm a no good husband. God, please just kill me and take me out of here. Oh, God, please kill me and remove me. I'm a no good pastor. I'm a no good husband. And he said, I went on condemning myself in prayer. And he said, after a while, I felt a slight squeeze from her hand. <laughs> and he said, I knew we were going to make it. And he said, so then the next Sunday, on Sunday, he said, I went to the church. Now he's telling this before 600 Christian leaders who have come there to find out how they can build a great church. This is, this is what he's telling them. <laughs> 700,000 people, size of the city of Fort Worth. So he said, I got up before my congregation and I humbled myself. And I said to them, I said, please forgive me I have missed God and gotten us into this, situ this terrible situation. Please forgive me and pray for me. My wife and others tried to tell me not to build the condominiums, but I didn't listen. And, uh, and I have missed God. I have failed God and gotten us into this situation. Please pray for me. And uh, he said there was an old Korean woman that he knew, very poor, and said she came up on the platform with a cardboard box that she ate out of and a pair of chopsticks. And he said, she said, Pastor, I want to give this box and my chopsticks to help pay for the church, to build the new church. And he said, now this conversation is going on in front of the congregation on a Sunday morning. And he said, Grandmother, I can't take that. That's all you have to eat with. And he said, she began to cry and she pushed it at him and said, no, take it. I'll eat with my fingers. This is all I have to give. And he said, all of a sudden, in his time of weakness, you know, Paul said, I learned that, when, <laughs> that God said, to him, Paul, my power is maximized in weakness. And the point he was trying to get across was when he had integrity, when he got up before his congregation, and admitted how much he needed God and how much he needed their prayers. And, and, and then this conversation with this little Korean grandmother, he said the power of God descended upon the congregation. And he said there was a, a businessman stood up and said, I'll give $30,000 for that cardboard box and chopsticks. 
And what he did, he gave the money to the church and gave the, the box and chopsticks back to the little grandmother. And he said all of a sudden, all over the congregation, people started standing up. And people started saying things like, we're going to put our house up for sale and we're going to move into those condominiums where you and your wife, unfinished condominiums where you're, your wife and you're living. He said young people started standing up and saying, we're going to go out next week and get a, a second job and give all the money to, uh, to, to pay off the building projects. And he said women who were poor, they cut off their hair and braided rugs and were selling them on the sidewalks. And it was just such an incredible thing. The Spirit of God was poured out in a spirit of generosity and benevolence. And the money flowed in like a flood. Enough not only to build this massive new 10,000 seat auditorium, but to finish building all the condominiums. <laughs> oh my goodness. And he saw, manifested that principle. Paul said here that God said to him, my power is maximized in weakness. And he's not talking about just going around being negative and poor me and so He's talking about being willing to have integrity and admit how much we need God. May the American church admit how much we need God. We are not adequate in ourselves. We're not sufficient in ourselves. In spite of all of our trappings, in spite of all of our cathedrals and musicians and worship teams, we are not sufficient. We are not adequate. And the sooner we realize how weak and ineffective we are and turn our eyes upon Jesus, the sooner we will see a mighty tsunami wave of real revival sweep across this land. Hallelujah. So those of you out there tonight, God wants to use, take the limits off yourself. <laughs> you feel weak like Gideon? Hey, you're ready. Now, if you feel like Moses, before he went to God's school in the wilderness, like Moses, you may have to spend a little time in his wilderness <laughs> to get you prepared. Oh, but I believe God is raising up an army of people in this hour. They've been through the wilderness. And now it's their time to come out into the open. And now it's their time to shine. It's their time to speak. And they realize how much they need God. They realize they're not trusting in themselves. They realize they're trusting on, in God. And they're leaning hard upon Him. Hallelujah. Lord, may it be God, I pray for mighty revival to sweep across America, across Canada, Ireland, the nations, the islands of the sea, the nations of the world. God, I pray for Afghanistan. You have to realize there might be, an, there might be a Gideon there in Afghanistan. We don't know. God is working. There might be a... a yeah, God still raises up political leaders. And I believe God even raises up military leaders. The Taliban is a wicked organization. Totally against everything that is godly and even human. So maybe there's a Gideon that God would raise up, an Afghan, who knows how to trust God, who's been through the wilderness. God, raise up your people in, Afghan, in Afghanistan. God, protect the Af Afghan people. Even if America and the Western world forsakes them, you have not forsaken them, Lord. And God, we rescue to raise up deliverance for the Afghan people tonight. Raise up the Gideons there, the Deborahs there. Raise them up, O oh God, in this hour we pray and bring deliverance to the land of Afghanistan. Let revival flow across that land. Let there be a mighty outpouring of your spirit. For you said in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And God, and I pray for everyone watching this stream right now who watch the archives. Lord, I pray for each one. God, that each person will take the limits off you and they'll take the limits off themselves. Because we belong to you, Lord. You see potential in us. Nobody else sees. And so, Lord, may we take the limits off you tonight and the limits off ourselves and see all that you want to accomplish in us and through us now 